Okay, so we have Mike Peterson here today, and we're going to record this interview. He's got a few things to talk about. We'll we'll banter things back and forth. Feel free to comment and ask questions. I'll try to keep up with that the best I can. And, um, you know, just listen to what Mike has to say. So, like I said before, Mike is our original macho man here. He's... Uh, <laughs> He's got disco in his soul and um, used to be out dancing in the clubs in that white white leisure suit. Uh, <laughs> but today he's here to talk to us about trading. And um, Mike, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background in trading, what brought you into trading and how things are, how, how you got started. Sure, you bet. <clears throat> Boy, it's always nice to be among friends. I appreciate you sharing that, uh, my disco history with everyone. Um <clears throat> I started out, my first job out of college at the University of Nebraska uh, was in a, a bank trust department. And we were, of course, managing trust accounts, pension accounts, things like that. And so I was, shall we say, grew up or brought up by uh, traders, stockbrokers, um, fund managers that were all buy and hold people. And that was that was it. That's all that you you talked about. That was what Warren made Warren Buffett rich. And so anything else other than the traditional blue chip buy and hold was just well, it was a scam or it was a flim flam or or anything like that. So I came to this with a lot of baggage. Um, Doug and I lived in the same town for a number of years. Uh, met one time over a cup of coffee, and, and Doug mentioned the type of trading that he did, and I, I, I just couldn't believe it. I just didn't think that that was right. That's you know no way these swing trades, and you're you know you've got a three to an eight day hold. What are you talking about? Um, and the one thing I want to make certain to everybody is Doug never pitched me on be on you know joining the trading service, joining the room. I was always the one calling him up, saying, "Hey, Doug, let's have breakfast, let's have lunch." Um, uh, you know, I want to learn more. And then finally, I decided, okay, I've you know I've got to I've got to start to learn how to do this. Um, and you you spent quite a bit of time practicing and day tra I mean practicing with paper trade account right oh absolutely I yeah. will we'll get to that guys there's three sections I want to kind of cover at the end, end of every section then we'll open it up for questions um, on that particular section and then move on um, once I, I, I joined the service and understood what was going on um, my ambition was to be the richest but the laziest trader around and I don't like to waste time I don't like to waste money or effort and so the first thing that once I understood what what this was about is I wanted to streamline what I was doing and so I took the uh, the CBOE listing of most optional traded stocks and I gleaned that list. I, I was starting out, I was trading a $25,000 IRA account, a $25,000 traditional account, and a $20,000 account for my son, my 28-year-old son. Um, and so, um, anyway, I wanted to break it down and to find those stocks with options. And a lot of times when I say, we say stocks, folks. I, I mean, I mean options that most fit my size of account. Um, uh, for instance, even today, I don't trade Amazon. I don't trade Netflix. I don't trade Google slash Alphabet. And I don't even look at those charts. The I wanted to concentrate on charts that that I could trade for my size of account. And of course, you know, you've heard Doug many times talk about the rule that that he has is is look for a position three to five percent of your account size so if you're trading a, a twenty five thousand dollar account you're trading anywhere from seven hundred and fifty to twelve hundred dollars on a three to five percent and again some of those higher price stocks i couldn't uh i couldn't mess with and so i literally downloaded the list and went through every stock and would pull up the options chain and look at them at 45 to 60 days out and what is the within the the uh, the 70 delta price range can i trade that type of of stock um and then i would would literally write it down make lists 
put them into those plastic clear sleeves that we used to put our high school book reports in and put them in a notebook. And I'm going to glean my list a little bit. I'm always adding to it, subtracting it. Um, I just counted it last night, and for some reason I have exactly 200 names in there. But that'd be the first thing, and I guess what my trading, the year, the few years that I've been doing this and the size of accounts, I probably appeal more toward the beginning trader, obviously, and someone who's trading a smaller account. I, I identify with that trader a, a, little bit, uh, a, a little bit better. But I think these same principles can work whether you're trading a $5,000 account or a $500,000 account. You have to build an inventory and you can't look at everything. Um, and there's, there's some stocks out there. Doug, some here on the screen, can we pull up the options chain for SNE, which is Sony Electronics? Uh, let's look at, at January, uh, January 2019. down into the Seve Delta range. Um, where is the column that shows how many you're open interest at? Sorry, I had changed that for class. There we go, open interest. Okay, now see, that's a chart that at least, as I learned from Doug, that it's, it's very difficult, though in the 70 Delta range, there are some open interests at the, the 77 Delta, there's 1,200 contracts, but by and large, that's not a chart that I would I would spend a lot of time with because of the, the in some ways limited range. If, if I, um, I would pass on that in a half a heartbeat. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So the first thing I would counsel you folks is, guys, I don't care how good the chart looks. If you're an options trader, if there's not an options chain there, don't waste your time. Move on. Don't even look at. It. In fact, I've got that marked on my TC2000. If someone says, hey, let's look at SNE. I've got it marked on there, few to no options, no trading. Now, someone else might be interested in it and can ask Doug about it. I'm not going to pay any attention to it. So, as I said, the first thing I would do is, is build yourself an inventory of stocks that you're constantly watching and, and looking at. So, what basically what you're doing is following the rule of of creating a qualified watch list, trades that fit you or stocks that fit you personally, that you can trade, fit your account, fit your trade size, um, and have good quality options available. Other than that, you're pretty much not interested or wasting any time on those other charts. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I, I, I will have a little bit of a tough love session here, folks. If I step on anybody's toes, I apologize. But guys, if you're, um, if you're an option swing trader, again, if there's no options there, why even watch the chart? I don't care how good the chart looks if you can't do anything with it. Leads me to the next thing is... Bill, you're right. Um, we're looking at a January contract. There's only 18 days. Mike's not suggesting that contract. He's bringing that up as an example. If you look at the February contracts, there are no... There's no open interest at all. So, I mean, what he's doing is bringing you up an example as to why he does what he does. He doesn't waste time. He's very efficient in the workflow that he has because he wants to get his job done and then get on with his life. He wants to be a trader. Yeah, exactly, Bill. I mean, that was, yeah, I wasn't suggesting that. Sony is, is a big time name. But there's just no options action there. So why, why don't, even, don't even mess with it, don't even follow it, at least in my opinion. Um, the other thing, and this, this will come to our second section, but when I first started out, I, I opened my account in February of 2016. Of course, all I did was paper trade. We've, we've made a lot of jokes about my lack of, of tech skills and that, that was it and so I, I paper traded from February of 2016 to July but when I paper traded I paper traded with a purpose that I wanted to learn what what am I comfortable with what fits for me what works for me what am what am I interested in and the kicking and screaming that I was drug out of the darkness was from a buy and hold to an option swing trader and you can run these experiments for yourself. You've probably seen them in, in real life examples, but it came very, very close to showing me a 10 to one ratio, meaning I would paper trade Intel by buying the equity 
and I would paper trade within our set of rules if it was there, Intel on, a, on an option. And gosh, if I made, in a five-day swing period, if I made 18 bucks on the Intel equity, I made 180 bucks on the Intel option, traditionally directional, uh, directional calls. And so that's the next thing that I would, would counsel you on is begin to figure out with, within a, 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 an area or parameters the type of trading that you like, that you feel comfortable with, that you understand. Um, and for me, it, it, it became swing trading options. Sure. Hey, uh, Woody, to answer your question, yes, if you, if you trade stocks only, you certainly don't have to go to the depth that we're going here with options and looking at the open interest. If you see a good setup on the daily uh, or any chart time frame that you're trading and you just want to trade the stock, by all means, um, that, just because we're talking about options today doesn't rule out your ability to trade a good pattern on the stock itself. It's just it does not qualify for an options trade. Um, and Glenn, TC2000, um, does have the ability to make a matrix um, of sorts um, for your options. But this is, I'm showing you Thinkorswim here. And um, I would say Thinkorswim, as far as a broker goes, is head and shoulders above um, uh, TC2000 brokerage. Um, however, the charts on TC2000 are miles ahead of Thinkorswim charts, and that's why I use TC2000 for my charting. So just to answer a couple of those questions, go ahead, Mike. Okay, all right. Okay, so that's the, the basic step one was, number one, build yourself an inventory. Number two, begin to kind of understand the type of trading that interests you, that you, you have a feel for. Now, Doug has talked many times. In fact, I think there's, there's actually a session recorded that you can go back in the archives and find where he talks about when he first started out, he did small spread trades. And there's, you know, he makes a very good case for someone starting out with a smaller account that what you can do with that. And so that, again, that is that is something that if, if that works for you, appeals to you, um, by all means, I would go back and, and listen to that, uh, that session time and time again. But the first thing is because th there are too many there are, there are too many options in trading options, shall we say. It's, it's, I use a lot of sports analogies. Um, you know, for a number of years, uh, Nebraska football, University of Nebraska football with Tom Osborne, very successful national championships, always winning a majority of their games. But he locked into a system. He tweaked it occasionally. But 90% of that time, he stayed with a certain type of system. He was going to going to run the ball first. He was, he was going to have a good offensive line. It's the same way in trading, guys. Find something that you're comfortable with that works for you. Occasionally you have to tweak it. Occasionally you have to add to your experience and knowledge and education. Sometimes market conditions warrant that. But for me, it's it's directional calls and puts. Um, I have a, a session in here we'll cover that. I'll, I'll you know talk about the mistakes I've made. For me, one of the mistakes I've, I've made is it seems like every spread trade we've ever put on, I've messed up. I don't know how I do it. <laughs> Doug is probably, you've heard the story many times about the Microsoft trade that I think lasted, did it go four months, Doug? Something like that. Four months, 100% return. I, I made 98 not 98%, $98. I think I was in that trade for four days. I had a whopping $98 profit. I just, I'd look at it. I couldn't understand it. I sold out of it. The people that stayed in it, as I said, had 100% return. I obviously spread trades I've, I've got to get better at and I'm working on, but right now for me, directional calls and puts. Well, and, and you know, the important thing to that, guys, is what you're hearing here is that Mike is following a set of rules and he's keeping it simple. He's picked out a strategy that works well for him and he's proven to himself first in paper trading and then in live trading, he's proven that it works. And so he just continues to repeat and stay with that simple plan, that simple system. Mike, um, 
what happens uh, we all break rules i mean we're I mean, we're human beings, we break rules. What happens to you when you step outside of the rules or try to get creative or things like that with your trading? What happens to those trades? I start uh, kind of reading my own press clippings. The one trade, when I step out of, of the, the parameters that, that we have established works. And then I think I got game and the next 10 trades, I, I shoot myself in the foot and lose money on. And then I come back to reality that, okay, Mike, you know, you're you're not doing you're not in your wheelhouse. Let's let's get back to what works. Uh, maybe I you need to learn some more, experiment some more, ask some questions. But it, it never fails. If if I if I think I want to try and get away with something, I do once, and so then I try it again, and it's just it, it's a it's a painful money losing process until I come back to reality. So you know, I think that's an experience that most most people have as traders. We go through a period where we feel like, hey, I've got this. I know more than the market knows. I you know we get a little bit cocky, and then we stretch ourselves. Uh, but we stretch ourselves in the wrong way. We stretch ourselves by breaking rules, by doing kind of dumb things. And um, the market has a way of humbling us every time we do that. So staying with a simple plan, a simple set of rules. And you know, guys, you don't have to know every strategy and you don't have to know every price pattern um, on the charts. Mike will tell you, he doesn't know every price pattern. He doesn't know every candle pattern. But what he does do is what he, what he understands and what he knows well, he sticks to that like glue. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. The next area that I, that, uh, I want to talk about, and again, as I, I mentioned, I opened my first account in, in February of 2016, is I do not believe that we paper trade enough. Um, we, we need to for a lot of reasons. Build experience, build confidence, experiment with some things, see how patterns work out. Um, but that's what I started doing. I literally paper traded from February of 2016 until I made my first live trade in July of 2016. And here, here is a suggestion um, that I have for paper trading. Because and, and and what I'm in is, is I'm in Thinkorswim is my trading platform, and then I have TC2000. Of course, I paper trade on on Thinkorswim's trading uh, paper trading side, and I I don't know they think they start you out with a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand whatever. Paper trade the trades that you can make per the real live account that you have. If you have a five thousand dollar account paper trade with those rules. Now I will tell you that a $2,000 or $5,000 account, you might have to occasionally push the envelope a little bit and step outside of the three to 5% uh, trading range. You might, on a $5,000 account, you might take one $800 trade and, and that'd be the only trade you have until you, you clear it. But anyway, paper trade commensurate to the size of account you have. But to gain experience, to gain knowledge, to gain insight, paper trade as many trades as you can. You might have a $5,000 account, so your trades are, are the $400 to, to $800 size, but you might have 20, on a, 20 of them at one time. Learn, you know, put that on there, track those trades, uh, you know, what's going right what's going wrong what did you learn what should you have done different were you at resistance were you at support uh, where did that trade come from uh, i always just record this stuff in a, in a spiral three ring notebook i just like again we used to carry it in high school i just write the date of the trade i'm making and i i can flip back two or three days and, and write the result is you know made 20 bucks lost 200 bucks whatever but i do not believe folks that we paper trade enough one of the the big experiments that i'm going to run this year is i'm going to paper trade a two thousand dollar account i want to see if commensurate with the types of trades you can take in a two thousand dollar account what you can do week after week month after month and i'll tie that back in in a minute um 
November of 2016, I, I took retirement from my factory job, and I just pretty much threw myself into this full time. Um, I was, as I said, I was working a factory job. I was working night shift. I get come home at seven o'clock in the morning, you know, log into the room, uh, listen to the lessons that were going on, make some trades. But then in 2016 is when I uh, retired from that job at age 58 and began trading full time. And the early part of the late part of 2016, of course, then leads into 2017. And gosh, what a year to learn to begin to trade was in 2017. Uh, I always kid people. I say, I'm not too sure that you physically couldn't have gone to Wall Street um, in New York, taken dollar bills, thrown them up in the air, and hundred dollar bills would have floated down. Um, We'll see years like that, but we're not going to see every year like that. From this, go ahead. I'm sorry. Question, Mike. Um, on your paper trading, um, you traded for a good solid period of time, but you've even experienced when when times are bad, you just stop trading and paper trade instead, and and test your results um, when the market is rough. Could you? Talk a little bit about that, that sometimes it's a good thing to just stand aside and see what the market's actually doing without risking money. Oh, absolutely. Now, I had to learn this the hard way, okay? Uh, you could pull up any chart, pull up the diamonds. I, you know, I started, again, reading my own press clippings. I was Mike Peterson. I was the king of the $100 profitable trade. <laughs> so I tried to real trade through the dip in February of this year and just got flat punched in the mouth. Um, and so then again, I had forgotten one of the, the, the biggest lessons is just go back just to keep your, your head in the game, so to speak, and, and uh, just go back to paper trading, Mike. And I, I felt I had that same vibe in December, and I know there's a lot of good traders in this room that made some money this month. I just wasn't picking up the vibe starting in early December. There was too much going on, both with the markets and in my personal life. I have a, a relative going through hospice right now, and I just I just couldn't concentrate on what was going on. But I did try and paper trade, and even the paper trades, calls or puts, it just, in fact, I, I told Doug one day, I had two calls on and two puts on, and with the market whip, all four trades and paper trades got stopped out. They were all losers. Yeah, all losers because the market went one direction early and then flipped around and went the, the other direction. But at least it reinforced for me that for me, I just, now was not the time to trade. Um, well, it helps you too. It helps you understand when, when, it's, when you're pushing the envelope. When, when the market is beyond uh, maybe your skill set or your speed, for trading and it, and it tells you when to back off a little bit. And, and you know, one thing I got to tell you guys, Mike is one of the best at doing this. He, he really gets into that and practices. He, he doesn't come to the market um, halfway. When he comes to the market, he's prepared with an idea, a trade, um, a plan all the way through before he even comes to the trading room and asks a question about a stock, he's fully prepared to pull the trigger on that position. He's just waiting for the green light. Some, some other confirmation. Some other somebody else to put their eyes on it and make sure that you're seeing it right. Hey. Correct? Exactly. Yeah. Aaron, to answer your question, the only thing wrong with paper trading, there's a no emotion. You're absolutely right. So, you know, folks, this is a discipline. You have to run this as a business. You're, you're, though there's no emotion of the real money, you've got to use that experience of what am I learning? What am I seeing? You know, where was that trade placed at? Was it at, was it at resistance? Was it, you know, at support? Um, but it's, it's something that I, at least for me, I, I feel, you know, uh, that, that has worked time and time and time again. So... Well, experience comes from more repetition. Yeah. Uh, the more you repeat the same process, the more you reinforce the rules, the better you become as a trader, the more disciplined you are um, to your trading plan, to your style. And it makes a difference to just stay in that mode 
um, stay in that groove, so to speak, of your plan and just keep it moving forward. Remember, guys, our ultimate goal here is not to be any kind of superhero trader. Our goal is every day, every week, every month, work to advance our account. It doesn't have to be by great big giant winning trades. It can be with small consistent gains. And that's what Mike has become the master of, is just those small consistent, just get in there and get out type trades. So we'll let him continue on here with that. Well, I, I, I did I wanted to save this section for a little bit later, but we'll cover it right now. Um, in September, my September stats were I made 47 trades. Wow. 40 of them were winners. Seven of them got stopped out or I lost money on. Some of them I I, I just thought that, hey, there's no, mom, no momentum here. I'm just going to go ahead and sell out of this thing at a, at a small loss before it trips my stop. Of the 40 winners, the net amount. Now, my, my losses were $506 on seven losing trades. The 40 winning trades generated a net amount of $4,600. Awesome. But guys, on 40 trades, that's a whopping 115 bucks Per trade. Per trade. Um, Doug, you and I couldn't get out of a nice steakhouse for 115 bucks for that's lunch. True. You know, that's true. Uh, those, <laughs> those side dishes will kill you. <laughs> And if, if you were telling somebody, if, if, if Doug had, had publicized that we're going to be interviewing a guy that, folks, he averages $115 a profit trade, <laughs> there wouldn't be anybody in the room today. You're probably right. But I'll tell you what, guys, for my size of account, and, and $4,600 was the best month I've had. Usually, I come in every month around 30 trades and around $3,000. Awesome. Once once you get to net figures. And so the principles are still the same thing. Whether you trade a five thousand dollar account, a fifty thousand or a five hundred, whether you're buying one contract, five contracts, or ten contracts, the result is still the same. Exactly. And and what's neat about this is once you build your confidence in doing what you're doing, a hundred a hundred dollars at a time, um, all you have to do is continue on that same path, just scale up the size of your trade. To, to where you're making, now you're making $200 a trade, and then it's $400 a trade because you're just scaling up as your account grows. Let me ask this question, Mike. Um, what gives you the confidence to be able to put on that many trades? Is it is it the paper trading? What's giving you the confidence to, to stick with that? Well, <clears throat> you're gonna find this hard to believe, but I listen well. <laughs> um, many, many, many times, well, 90% of my trades don't come from me. That that same trade might I might have, have it highlighted, but somebody else has already beat beat me to it. You know, I start out I'm I'm in I'm in both rooms, so I start out in, in uh, hit and run candlesticks in the morning, make the make the switch over. Uh, you know, when we shut down at, at noon here in this room, uh, I take a lunch break and then I go back over to hit and run candlesticks. And so people will say, um, you know, I'm um, I'm in IBM, and you or Rick will will comment. Boy, that's a good looking trade. That that chart is setting up for this. Well, that's all I need to hear. I I mean, I'll go to the, into the options chain if there's an option there that I can trade it. Rick has already told somebody in in his room, or you've already mentioned that. Hey, that's the right time to enter that, or that's a good looking trade, or that's uh, you know that's 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 you know a classic pop out of the box. I'm, I'm, I've done it enough now that I know, I know how to look for a 70 delta uh, 45 to 60 days out. I just make the trade. Many, many, many times, month after month, 90% of my trades, someone else has already beat me to it and suggested or mentioned it or, or talked about what they were into and has gotten feedback from you or Rick giving them, you know, shall we say a green light or a thumbs up or a, a, an indication that that looks like a pretty solid trade. And so that's one of the topics I was going to touch on earlier is, guys, we got to put our egos aside and we got to start paying a little attention to what other traders are, are talking about showing, posting, because there are good trades there. I've proven it. I, I should have with those stats on September, I would just bet you 
80 percent of the 80 to 90 percent of those trades had initially been suggested by somebody else and i just i just followed them in now when you're saying 80 to 90 percent you're not talking about just me and rick no you're no, talking no. about other traders in the room right no i mean i could linda j joe aaron bob c i mean i'm gonna leave somebody out when i start mentioning names um <clears throat> But, you know, somebody will say, hey, Rick, can we look at this chart? I, I like the, you know, the, the, you know, the February, uh, you know, 45 calls. It might not be something that, that I was looking at. I might have it on my list. But if Rick or Doug then comments on it, that's all I need to do. I don't, I don't need to think, well, since I didn't bring it up, um, I'm not going to trade that. If, if, if there's a green light given or a thumbs up given and it's a trade I can make, you, you make know, the trade. yeah. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even have TAL anywhere on a watch list. And, um, I can't remember who I should give credit to, but about a month, month and a half ago, somebody suggested, Hey, let's, let's look at TAL. It was in, it was in, uh, you know, right way options. You again, commented favorably that that was, you know, a, a good looking trade. Went into it, held it three days, made, you know, 225 bucks. There you go. Didn't even have it on a watch list. Where did it come from? Another trader in the room. Right. And that's the power of the room. Hey, um, um, question for T. Uh, well, actually, Sully, um, what's your commission rate with Toss? Um, I've negotiated it down to a dollar twenty-five per transaction per contract so if i buy a contract obviously i'm going to have to sell it the total commission on that would be two dollars and fifty cents 250 round trip yeah yeah buck yeah buck 25 to buy buck 25 to sell um i will eventually make the switch over to uh to trade your trade hawk but i'm a real slow learn on technology and i'm comfortable with t or with uh uh think or swim um and I, I think that's a pretty good rate. I might call them here in January and see if if something else can be done. That's but awesome. I I can live with a buck twenty five per transaction. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, do you still use the CBOE list? Once I pretty much have have got everything gleaned and downloaded, because it really doesn't matter, guys. Um, that you know, don't worry about okay, because Apple is always going to be near the top as far as um you know the the amount of options activity when it, within its option change i don't need to know if the rankings change that much i pretty much got my list occasionally people will throw other other stock symbols and other trades out there i'll look at that and go well gosh i i must have missed that i'm just going to go ahead and add that this week will be a down week and i'll glean my list i'm going to take some things off and then i'm going to add some things plus i also I, I keep track of what i call the xl products xle xlf xlb that type of thing um let's so, see so the majority of your trades the, your list primarily started from the cboe list exactly and then you what you've done is gleaned out what doesn't work what doesn't fit what doesn't have enough volume you know too expensive too expensive you've just gleaned that list out and you're constantly uh, for lack of a better word, because I've used it before here, is uh, you're farming that list. You're continuously cultivating that list, adding stocks back that's mentioned in the room, mentioned by other traders in the room that look good, adding stuff back and then pulling stuff out when they start falling apart and are no longer qualifying as a trade. Is that Would that be correct? Yeah. Yeah. So you're not... Um, you're. Are you doing any scanning at all for any of your lists? No, not yet. I'm going to begin to start, but it's with great trepidation that I that I'm thinking about scanning, and and I'll explain that in a little bit. A couple of quick questions, uh, Sully. It's it's a dollar twenty five per transaction. So if I buy a contract, I pay a buck twenty five. When I sell it, I'm charged a buck twenty five. Joe, your your question about trade year. I just need to sit down and do the math. You're probably right. Um, it's just the fact that. Having learned uh, think or swim, to have to trade change over, I'll probably open a, a small account and, and begin to make the tran transfer and transaction in the learning curve. But like I said, you're talking to a guy that's never even sent a text message on a phone. So sure, yeah. Anyway, um, okay. Um, 
continuing with the with the, with the paper trading account, I just think it's the fact that this is a, a great way to um, just you know it, it, I use a lot of sports analogies. Um, you know, it's every major college, every NFL football team, they will have scrimmages during the the off season or in between where they have refs. They're they're scrimmaging somebody else, they're scrimmaging their second team, they're keeping track of penalties and yards and that type of thing. But obviously, it's not a real game; it doesn't count. Right. And that's what paper trading is. But I'll tell you what, folks. It has helped me immensely. It has opened my eyes. It's given me the confidence. Um, again, I was a slow learn when it comes to the tech side of things, just the actual ex uh, executing the trades. But it, it also just, well, again, it's just repetition, repetition, repetition. Right. Hey, Bal had a question that he'd ask. He was asking about, do you wait in the morning before pulling the trigger on a trade? Or, uh, uh. I just, you know, it's, it's kind of wherever you're getting that vibe and that feel from. Um, obviously, we've talked many times now the past, I don't know, three to four months, it's, it's been very topsy-turvy. I mean, we've seen price reversals within the hour. Right. Um, usually, I, I have, um, um, I have my, my watch list and I have maybe one or two or three trades that I've identified that I want to take a look at. And, you know, we've heard Rick and Doug say many times that first half hour to 45 minutes, let's just see what the market's going to do. Um, and that, that pretty much is it. And then at some point in time, you know, I'll pose the question to Rick or I'll pose the question to you, depending on where I'm at in the room. This is the trade I'm looking at, you know, give me, give me your opinion. And then from there, is is pretty much when I when I go ahead and execute it if I get the the okay the thumbs up the you know that type of thing. So the point being, you're not rushing into any trade. You're you're putting quite a bit of little, quite a little time in thought preparation, being ready for the trade, and then posing the question to someone else to have their review of that before you're actually making the decision on the entry yeah so there's yeah. no rush into any trade it's either my trade or again it's one of our other good traders in the room has posed the question to you guys and you have commented favorably on that that at point in time that's that's when i execute the trade awesome. um, i see there's a um a question in here about you know um the setup that you're looking for buying and selling you know, I, I, I understand basic round rounded bottom uh, breakout. I understand basically pop out of the box. You you'd initially had asked me a little bit about do I do I use any uh, indicators? I, let me let me back up a little bit. Saturday or Sunday evenings is I sit down every week and I pull up chart after chart in my inventory and I put a horizontal line at where that uh, position ended the week at and I only have one line on there every week I move the line and so let pull up Apple if you could real quick I think Apple at least at, at the end of Friday was around 156.23 uh, Friday and so I, I I put a line across there and I just you begin to look and 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 say okay where is this thing going what's going on here um, uh, there's only three things that uh, a stock can do, guys. It can start, it's trending up, it's stair-stepping down, or it's pretty much marching in place, um, uh, you know, it's consolidating, moving sideways. And when I just draw a horizontal line, it pretty much begins to show me, you know, what is this thing doing? It, um, You're still paying attention to trend, though. Correct? Yes, absolutely, Ab yeah. absolutely. Something I, I'm I'm working through again on a paper trading because we've talked about it many times. Is it's tough to fight the general trend of the market. I'm wondering at times, are there positions out there that I should have traded that we may, maybe the market is is moving up, but this thing was tracking down for a put, uh, vice versa. Um, so that's my indicator is the eyeball test is I'm looking at these charts daily. 
Um, if it's moving sideways, I might come back and check it in the middle of the week. But, um, you know, off of the horizontal line I, I've, I've, I've put on there, where is this thing going? Sure. Now, what I want to reiterate here, because a question about um, the stocks, when you said your inventory list, you're talking about you're talking about that qualified list that you work from. And that's what you're looking at every Saturday, every Sunday, and you're building a short list from that. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're not you're not out there, um, you know running scans or just going through every chart in TC2000 or something, you're staying with your very confined list yep. that you know is qualified for you. And in that way, do you feel like in watching those charts over and over and over every day, like you do, that you begin to get a sense of how they move? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, let's pull up Coca-Cola. Maybe um, back it into a little bit into the fall, you know, and you, we could see how it, it kind of traded in a range here from 45 to to uh, 46, uh, 43 to 45 through this period here. Yeah, you know, or or uh, but you just you can begin to 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 just kind of get an idea of of you know it'll rise up, it'll drop down, it'll rise up, it'll drop down. We'll come back to this chart in a minute for another example. Um, so you're sticking with your list. You're not you're not jumping out of that parameter. What I'm trying to point out here, guys, is is that Mike is very consistent. You notice that he's not jumping around. He's staying with his qualified list. It doesn't matter what I say, Rick says, or anybody else says. If it doesn't fall within his parameters that fits into his qualified list, he's not interested, doesn't have time for it. Exactly. Okay. Mart, the question you have is, Mike, what is your setup preference, a pop-up or a pullback and then a move-up? You know, I um, um, I really don't care. If, if, if I think a, a chart is moving in a direction for a call, for a call or a put, and I then get, to, you know, get a second set of eyes put on it, I don't care what you call the pattern. Is this thing going to make me some money? Is there... You know, is there the money here to be made? Um, uh, Solely, that would be correct. It's when Toss gives you a dollar twenty-five per contract. That means if he trades five contracts, it's five times one twenty-five. So, uh, please understand, Mike is still making that average a hundred, hundred twenty dollars a trade, paying those commissions. So. Mike, is a, is the commissions at a buck twenty five a big worry for you? Not anymore. No, I mean, guys, I first started out, I, I didn't know any better. I was paying nine bucks, you know. So, right. you know, um, and still making money. So, you know, I'll make the the the, the switch over to our new vendor, but um, it'll happen sometime this summer, and you know, I'll switch part of the account and you know begin to learn their technology and their. Uh, their execution methods and everything. Um, Rick's got a question. What percentage of your trading account do you trade? Um, I, I've been, I don't think I've ever been past 50%. Um, 50% of your capital in the market. Yeah. Yeah. It just, I'm only going to take good trades. I don't, uh, uh, you know, if, if a trade doesn't, doesn't fit the rules, um, and I'll, I'll touch on this because that's one of the big mistakes I made uh, one other time is, you know, you don't trade for trading's sake. Right. Um, okay. The one pitch that I would want to make, and again, this is my personal opinion only, particularly when you're starting out or you're, you're trying to, uh, to uh, establish a, a consistent, profitable pattern, is to me, it's just easier to learn directional calls, directional puts. Now, you had mentioned one time, Doug, again, that when you first started trading, there were certain type of spread trades that you took. Right. By all means, guys, if that has an interest to you, go back and, and, and listen to that lesson that, that Doug has put. But to me, that's the, the basic core um, foundation of what we do. Because the stock, to make you money, is it's either going to move up or it's going to move down. The stock's got to move. Yeah, that's, that's it. Um, but... 
am I expanding my knowledge, expanding my experience? Again, I've got to get better at our different type of, of spread trades. The market at times is going to warrant that. Uh, I've got to get more discipline, which, of course, is, you know, is, is back to uh, um, using the paper account. But I don't mean to brag, but I will. From what my dear sweet mother tells me, when I was a kindergartner, I was a pretty sharp little kindergartner. <laughs> and gosh, when I was a first grader, I was a pretty sharp little first grader and so on. But when I hit first grade, they didn't move me up to third grade. When I hit third grade, they didn't move me up to fifth grade. And at times I can tell you guys that seeing some of the comments that people post, um, I wonder if at times you guys aren't pushing too hard. If if you're not making consistent money on the simple, basic directional calls and puts, my personal opinion is I wouldn't work so hard to get into some of these exotic involved trades because I, I, I just think you're missing something. Now, that's... That's my opinion, but uh, take it for what it's worth. But you know, you gotta you gotta crawl before you walk and walk before you run. Um, it's a great example. You know, when I first started trading, I started the same way. I worked really, really hard just to learn how to trade calls only. I just wanted to do directional calls. Once I finally felt like I had that under my belt, I started adding in directional puts. And it it, it takes a long time to build enough confidence in what you're doing to be able to build on that experience and then add different strategies to your trading. Yep, yep, exactly. Okay, the next section I wanna to move to is profits, taking profits. Um, we, of course, so many times put this into a, to a dollar amount, you know, a $100 profit or $120 profit or whatever, but behind the scenes, um, you're looking at percentages. Um, for me, again, it's, it's just a, a vibe. Uh, I always call it the whiplash effect. I pull up my, my thinkorswim account and I look over at where I'm at with my trades listed and, you know, the profit or loss since the, the trade was open column. If that's enough for me to look twice, to snap my head back around, at that point in time, I start doing some calculations. You know, where are we at on that trade? What's my percentage of profit? Uh, you know, there's a dollar figure there, of course. And, and folks, it, it comes down to this. With money, you can, well, there's a hundred different ways, places you can you go with it. But let's look at $500. You can make it an option trade with $500. Easy. You can't get into real estate for $500. You can't get into the cattle business for $500. Uh, if you take $500 to the bank, most of the time, that's a passbook savings account, and they will give you three-tenths of 1% for one year. Here, we can take $500, put it into an option swing trade, make 100 bucks in four days. And that whatever that percentage works out, 100 bucks on, on $500 is, is a 20% is a return in four days. And yet I see people post comments that, well, I just thought it might go higher. Yeah. Well, here, here's a perfect example that I wrote out, guys. You got $190 pure profit in a trade. You've been in the trade for four days. Of those, it's had five up candles in a row. You've been in there for four of them. It's 11 o'clock in the morning on a Friday. Of that $190 profit, 90 of it is is comes in today since the market opened at 8.30. And like I said, and it's a Friday. And you can't decide whether or not to capture the profit or not. It's just like, come on, guys. You know, I, I used to be a factory worker. I made, for, you know, for, for a small Midwestern town, made 20 bucks an hour. Great benefits, a retirement plan second to none. But I had, you know, I had ear protection. I had heavy work boots. I'm standing on a stress mat, but I'm doing 12 hours a night on concrete, standing next to an assembly machine, making 20 bucks an hour. Glad to have it. Wonderful company. They took care of the Peterson family very well. Let me get this straight. I make a few keystrokes. I come back four days later, um, a few more keystrokes, um, and I made 100 bucks. How easy is that? Could I have done that at the bank? No. And for me, again, personally, 
It doesn't bother me because we're always looking at the same charts. It doesn't bother me to take a profit around 100 bucks. And two days later, if I'd have held on, I'd gone to 140. But it's like nails on a blackboard for me to not take it at 100 bucks. And two days later, it's down to 40 bucks. Right. So consistency with taking that off, do you, do you, because you are very, very good at taking those profits off and not allowing the greed portion to get to you. One of those reasons I think is because you're so active with the number of trades that you put on. You're not scared to enter trades. You just continuously are looking for that new trade, that confirmation, and then you're in the position. But you want to be circulating that money pretty regularly in and out, in and out. Average hold time, would you say, under 10 days? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, in 2017, it was eight Eight days. Um, eight days for the bulk of 2018 it was five days the last 90 days it's been three days okay i think the market i mean you pull up any chart yeah uh, you look at coca-cola you know try and count in there how many up candles in a row you have right if you get past five that's that's unusual right um that doesn't mean it's gonna the bottom's gonna drop out sometimes it pauses you know consolidates uh, that type of thing but um I, you know, it just seems here recently, uh, with as much uh, whiplash and volatility we've had in the market, you know, I put something on, I, I check it, you know, there's some money to be, there's some money there. Let's just take the profit and call it good. So, would you say anywhere between ten and twenty percent? You're really, you're really watching for reasons or signals why you should be taking profit rather than trying to squeeze another penny or two out of it or yes yeah i mean it goes back to the same thing okay there's i've had it 3 days there's there's 15% there is there any more to be, there could be but it's a we're up against a friday in the weekend let's just take it now i can always buy back in right i traded twillo in that those september stats i traded twillo 3 times that month sure I traded a, a, a directional call, a directional put, a directional call. Um, in and out of the trades and just, just following that same simple plan. Put $500 into a trade looking for 100, 100 bucks out and just moving, continuously moving that money around. Yeah, I mean, there. I even did, I think on AMD, I did the old manage a profitable trade. I had three contracts. Um Sold two of them, had you know two hundred bucks. Held the other one for another three, two, three days. Made another one hundred twenty bucks. Which, you know, before I'd have, I'd have sold all three positions. But so I'm, you know, I'm getting better. I'm growing. I'm, I'm becoming familiar. Um, but like I said, it comes down to the fact, guys, that you got to be profitable. Right. You got to be profitable. And you know, and it doesn't matter, guys. If you're a bigger trader, if you're trading more contracts. Um, I, I shared this the other day where I made a, a, a trade for my phone on the diamonds the day my internet was down and I made 1500 bucks. Now I made 1500 bucks because I traded 10 contracts. Mike Peterson trade, if you traded one contract on that, you made $150. It's the exact same trade. It's just that you can scale it to any size and you don't have to be you don't have to be looking at every single thing in the market to be able to do that. You don't have to be jumping around with what's in the news or what's popping today. It's those consistent charts that you've been watching for a long period of time. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. And we got a question here on average, what is your max size contract per trade? Do you scale in or average down? Um, is it okay to buy one kind Track, yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever taken more than three contracts on a position. Maybe four. Um, usually, I'm I'm one to two to three. And you stay within that rule of somewhere around three to four or five percent uh, max. Yeah. Um, usually, you're under four uh, percent. Yeah. Well, my one account has grown. My IRA has grown from twenty five thousand to forty five thousand, and I've I've taken profits off of that on a semi regular basis. My my traditional account has stayed around twenty five thousand because that's every I call it I call it Paycheck Friday. The last Friday of every month, I call up um, TD Ameritrade, and whatever I have gained in that account for a net amount since the previous month, I have them send me a check. 
I don't even want to transfer it in my bank account. I physically want a check. I love getting money in the mail. We all get bills in the mail. We get junk mail. I get a check in the mail. I walk into the bank with it. And all the gals, you know, in a small town, they know you. Sure. And they're, they're all, you know, hooting and hollering that, ah, oh, must be must be paycheck Friday, huh? And, and uh, so that account has stayed at 25000 Okay. Uh, and I, I, I trade the same... I trade the same trades. Yeah, Linda, Linda calls it mailbox, mailbox money. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I make the same trades from my traditional account. I make the same trades from my IRA, and I make the same trades from my son's account. My son thinks I'm a genius because he hasn't <laughs> taken any money. He's 28 years old. He hasn't taken any money out of his account, and he just can't believe that you know the returns that this thing is getting. Um, but. Um, so so you're skimming one account and just taking it as fun money. Yeah. And yeah, that just supplements my retirement to let me do what I want to do when I want to do it, how and, I want to do it. In your other account, you are taking some fun money out of it from time to time. Occasionally, yeah, yeah a little bit. Uh, when I need to do some traveling or there's a big ticket item I want to buy or something. Sure. Yeah. And, and guys, that's important too. Some of you may not have to be you know be taking anything out but what mike does is, is he makes a point of rewarding himself for his work that he's that he's staying that there's a reason why he's doing this and the reason why he's working so hard to improve every day because he likes he likes those nice little rewards at the end so okay uh fred it said mike would you mind sharing your list to get us started i i, I don't uh... What what I would say is is go to the to the C, download the CBOE listing and I mean the, the list is two hundred names long I, I can't um, I can't you know write out or send out an email or or whatever but just begin to go through that and what can you trade for your size of account um, and um, that's you very know. important Fred um, you have to make your list it has to fit you personally. You and Mike and me and Rick and Bob C and Aaron and Linda, we're all different traders. We have different, different um, uh, account sizes. We have uh, different, um, shall I say, money hangups or issues that we, you know, that we want to focus on. We may even have slightly different rules that we set up for ourselves. And so you need to make that list your own. And that's one thing that, that Mike is, that's a very personal list to you. It, it fits you personally. It, it may not fit anyone else. It fits you. And so everyone needs to create that. And guys, you can get that. It, it, it's not a hard process. Let me, let me just take for a second here to remind everyone Mike is not running that list off of any kind of a fancy scan or anything he pulled up the CBOE list one time because I was there and helped him do it had to <laughs> and from that he wrote it out on notebook paper and that's what he still uses today okay it's and, and that's been two years mm-hmm Two years he's been working from the same list now stocks i'm i'm guessing stocks have come on that list and stocks have been thrown off of the oh yes yeah. because you're farming that all the time but the point is it's is it's your list it's personal to you and because you're watching that list every single day you've grown to understand those stocks how they move how they function and that's also a key element i think to you being successful because you you have a sense of what's going on in that in that chart would you agree yep i got a great great question here from rickster uh, do you think your banking experience has helped in any way guys every movie you've ever seen about wall street the, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street, the, the Michael Douglas Wall Street movie, any of those things, that's what the back room of a trust department of a, of a bank looks like. It's not the staid, um, you know, button down. You have guys in there that probably uh, couldn't get a job doing anything else. Um, you know, we're talking about, you know, oh, this thing is, you know, this thing isn't worth the paper it's written on, you know, but let's buy 6,000 shares. I mean, it's, 
uh, I didn't learn a lot for the the thing I, I came away with that Rick was baggage. I mean, I you can talk to Doug. The I, I should say the the lively spirited discussions we would have <laughs> about buy and hold versus swing trading because that's all I knew. Right. That's all I knew. How can you make money on something that you're only holding eight to eleven days? That's impossible. Um, so, and I would say with stocks, you're probably right. Stocks are pretty hard to make that happen. With options, um, not so tough. True, true, not so tough. Continuing on on our taking profits, um, I just think, guys, that one of the things. Now we'll go to the mistakes I made, and wow, um, at one time I thought, okay, I'm going to set goals. And so I, I set a, a goal for number of trades, and I set a goal for average trade size, and I set a goal for profit size. And that, well, it, it, it started in, in, uh, in January of 2018. It came to, through 2017, and, you know, I, uh, I thought, wow, I, I got game here. I'm, I'm it, man. I'm, I'm the king of the $100 profit trade, so let's, let's set some goals, Mike. And what I found myself doing was over trading. You know, it's it's three days to the end of the month, and I'm eighteen hundred dollars away from my profit goal. I got to start putting some trades on. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, Mike. Only you know you you need good trades that fit the trading rules. But pretty soon I was I was trading for trading's sake, and of course when that happened was when we hit the dip in February of two thousand eighteen. Um, so the one hard and fast rule I have now is I understand and know some basic trading patterns that pop out of the box, rounded bottom breakout. But 99% of my trades have either been favorably commented, have come from somebody else in the trading room and be favorably commented on by you or Rick, or I have posted that trade to you and Rick and received a favorable comment on. That's the trades I make. If I can't get a second set of eyes with a favorable comment, I just don't do the trade anymore because I have proven to myself that if I go off the reservation, boy, can I just shoot myself in the foot. You know, my my gunslinger mentality of ready, fire, aim approach hasn't always worked. <laughs> so consistency with that. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, we're coming up to 11 o'clock. Should we take a short break? I've got one or two uh, points I want to make and then we maybe have some questions and then just go back to the room and start looking at charts we sure can if you guys want to take a quick break i'm going to pause the recording okay so we're back guys um mike there was a question while you were gone um a question about how can you uh, how many trades do you need to think about before putting yourself in a situation of over trading well, that again comes down to the rules, guys, and I violated those rules. I, I, I went off of, boy, I've, you know, my goal is to make 20 trades a month and I've only got 13 of them on. I got to get with it. Or my profit goal is $2,000 for this account and I'm only at, at 1200 I got to get with it. And, and that's the problem. Guys, stick to the rules. A good trade is a good trade. Have a second set of eyes put on that trade. Have somebody else comment or pick up a trade that somebody else has commented on. But, you know, I've had as many as 15 trades on and I've had as, as little as two trades on. But there is no, there is no magic number there. Um, it, 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 all, it all comes out in the wash. If you're making money, then those are good trades. But what I found is when I started to to trade just to to think, well, I, I got to put some trades on to make my goal, is I was reaching for trades. I was stepping outside the, the, the rules. I was exceeding everything. And I just shot myself in the foot. I didn't even come close to hitting those goals. So that's something... He, I can't guarantee you the results, guys, but I can guarantee you the effort. And the effort is you have your inventory list, you're constantly monitoring it, looking for, for what your experience level shows you uh, should be a, a, a position moving into a trade. And then you take it to the room and get a second set of eyes, Rick or Doug primarily, because those are to, to, to comment on it or listen for what someone else is doing. If Rick's, 
is telling Aaron, Aaron, that's a good looking buy on IBM for, for March uh, 2019 calls. If that fits you for trade size, price size, that type of thing, what more do you need to hear, guys? You know, go from there. Would you agree, Mike, that there are, you may reach your goals on a monthly basis, but it doesn't come consistently like every week you make a number. It You might be um, one or two weeks where the market is just not performing and you're not doing much trading, and then it all comes back at the, the next week and you make your month just kind of all at once because the market is so back and forth, the ebb and flow in the market. Correct. Again, don't don't just force yourself or say, hey, you know, I, I got to have three trades this week or I got I got to make I, I break it down into averages. But don't you you got to you you, you got to let the market come to you and you got to let the trades come to you and you got to take what you can get within our parameters and our rules. My I have a 100 percent trading return for the month of December, 100 percent. Why? Because I haven't made a trade since December 4th. Right. I, I just couldn't pick up the vibe. I know other good traders have been, been banging out trades. I just, my head wasn't into it. Again, I had a, a relative that we were worried about a hospice situation. And so my, my tongue-in-cheek comment of I've got 100% return is, is I just made some paper trades to see if I was, you know, keep, to kind of keep my head in it. But at times, even those were reversing on me. I just left everything in the, the money market side uh, or the cash reserve side of my trading account. Didn't I have not made a trade since December 4th and not worried about it. Right. I just I couldn't devote the time to it. And I just thought, in my opinion, there was too much market volatility in WIP. But again, I've seen other people post good trades. It works for them. Um, but it just it just didn't didn't have the, the feel for me. So don't force it. Every time I've ever forced a trade, I've lost money. Right. So it's it's a pretty it's pretty fun, fair to say then um, when you feel like you're in the zone, when you feel like the market's working out for you, the trades are setting up. That's when you get very active. When you feel this or get the sense that the market is just not performing very well, you've got no problem just backing away and protecting your capital. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, don't I, have to trade just to be trading. Yeah. I go back to what an old stockbroker told me. His rule number one is don't lose money. His rule number two was try and make a little money. <laughs> His rule number three is... Don't forget rule number one. Warren Buffett. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell you what, guys, I've got our national championship locker room pep talk now, and then we'll start to, to actively take questions. This past year, when I would, would log into either room, I'd always say, good morning, team. Let's go find us some money. And it dawned on me that I'm going to change that, whether you call that your war cry, your mission statement, whatever. And I want each and every one of us to think about this. I, uh, I want you to put this somewhere to where you can see this every day. I've got a little inch wide foot long banner on the second shelf of my computer uh, desk at home. And I wrote out this, why not me? Why not us? See guys, true financial wealth and security doesn't have to be just for hedge fund managers or trust fund uh, babies that are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. I am convinced after two years, guys, that we have the knowledge, we have the experience, uh, we, we have the tools that we can build for ourselves commensurate with, with where we start true financial security. We've, this is from years ago. They talked about the, remember the Beardstown, the Beardtown Ladies Investment Club? I'm going to make a prediction, and Doug hates predictions, but I'm going to make a prediction. I will just bet you sometime in the next 10 years, some industry publication will do a feature article on hit and run candlesticks right way options. <laughs> For this fact, these guys, and when I say guys, I'm talking about the people in the room have always stuck together. They've learned from each other. They've encouraged each other. They've chastised each other, but they've built on their experience. They've, they've shared their knowledge, their trades. They have a system that works. 
Things change occasionally in the market, but it's it's the same building blocks upon building blocks. And I guess the question is, guys, there's not a person here today logged in or that will listen to this recording that can't give me three reasons why we, each and every one of us, whether you start with $2,000 or you have a $200,000 account, why you can't put together the financial security that, that, that you want, that you need, that you're comfortable with. I mean, do you realize, think about this, and I don't care what size of account this is. If you had an account that you were consistently taking $1,000 a month out of to supplement either your income, your retirement income, whatever, and leaving additional $1,000 in there to build your account, you are ahead of 99 and 9 tenths of the traders. And guys, we can do that. We're going to do that. If we're not sophisticated enough for you, if we're a little too backwards and hokey, hey, tell you what, no problem. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you in two or three years if you if you can swallow your pride and admit that all these other services that you spent almost thousands of dollars on, when they have just about blown your account out, come on back. We're, we're understanding people. We'll welcome you back. But guys, let's just do this. That's That's what we're going to do. We can, you know, for the newer traders, sometimes guys, not every question can you pose in the room. You, you've got to do a lot of study and a lot of work on your own. For the more advanced traders, sometimes guys putting in some of these exotic uh, big time spread trades, appreciate you sharing that with us. It's going to help some people grow. If a lot of people aren't latching onto that, be patient. But guys, together, we are going to do this. And so I'm just encouraging each and every one of you, put that banner someplace. Tape it to your desk. Put it across the top of the monitor. Why not me? Why not us? So the team approach uh, uh, is, and I've t I talk about that quite often, that right way options, hit run candlesticks is not about Rick or, or myself. It's about the team working together, all of those trained eyes on the market, everyone helping each other improve as a trader and working together to get that done. That's the power of the room. Exactly. Well, like I say, when 90% of my winning trades come from other traders in the room, I might have had that, that same stock on a watch list. Somebody else beat me to it. Somebody else got the favorable comment on it. Boom, I make the trade. Sure. Uh, like I said, uh, uh, I a month ago made a nice little profit on TAL. I didn't even have it, have it anywhere on my watch list. Somebody suggested it in the room. It was commented favorably on. Three days later, I made you know two hundred bucks, and now it's in my in my inventory. Sure. So, okay. Sorry, guys. A lot of you guys have have posted questions. You're going to have to repeat them. My my poor friend Ball has put the same question in three times that I've ignored you. Let's go ahead now and and just start in with the questions. Uh, Mike, what is your setup preference? Again, Mark, doesn't matter. If if I'm I'm um I, I'm beginning with my experience level to recognize a, a round of bottom breakout or a pop out of the box or something. Um Again, if if I think it's it it's it's warming up or catching my attention, it's on a watch list, and and then I ask Doug or Rick to comment on it. Um, I just opened the CBO list. Was the difference between? Uh, do you understand that one that, that this gentleman? Um, F F F. We can talk about that later. Um, that's kind of off the subject, but CBOE list is already sorted for those that are uh, for call options. Um, it's sorted as soon as you download it for call options um, to show up as the highest rank. So um, if Apple happens to be the the busiest you know that month apples at the top of the list sure. it might be apple it might be bac it might be and the thing is guys that list doesn't change very much um the the top 200 doesn't change very much no it stays pretty pretty solid so um where mike downloaded it once and he's used the same list for two years now he's never looked at it again never downloaded it again you don't have to get too complicated with that uh, David asked, what is your typical hold period? Again, David, I mean, I think this past year I made 300 bucks in an hour. Um, but usually I, in 2017, the market wasn't as volatile. 
my average hold was eight days. Um, in the early part of this year, it was five days. The past 90 days has been three days. It's just wherever I'm getting that vibe that I've got a nice little profit in there. It might be stalling out or the market might reverse or that particular stock pattern is after two or three or four days, it, it shows a bit of a pullback. I just go ahead and, and, and you know, cash it in and, and take the profit. So with all your trading, you said sometimes you might have 15 positions on at once. You also said that you rarely, if ever, have a go over 50% of your account invested in the market. Um, would you would you say that um, you base how active you are in the market by the condition of the market, by how the trades are setting up, how many trades are being talked about or offered up in the room, and you're moving with that rather than trying to hold some specific quota that I can only hold five trades at a time or anything like that. You're moving with the market when it's moving for you. Yeah, I try. And, uh, you, you have a saying that I believe the gentleman that invented uh, – Think or Swim came up with, which was trade small, trade often. Right. Now, again, we're, we're trading often as it fits our rules. We're not trading to be trading. Right. I, you know, probably 50% of my trades are one contract trades. 30% of my trades are, are two contract trades. And 20% of my trades are three contract trades. I don't think I've ever gone over a three contract trade, um, the dollar amount or, or whatever. But that just... That breaks your rules. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, ratio of profit to loss. Vern, September was an un unusual month. It was 85% profit, 15% loss. It usually just falls right at 70%. 70% winners, 30% uh, losers. The average loss is about $75. The average win is about, uh, you know, about $150. Um, uh, you know, uh, so Kathy says, how do you set the initial s stop and options? There's numerous pieces uh, in the archive, Kathy, but I basically go with, um, you know, where the, the volatility stop, the green and, and, and red dots are on a position. Um, Ball, thanks, Ball, for posting this question. I'm sorry to ignore it. So many ideas a minimum open interest figure for your option selection. Usually for me, as low as I trade, if 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 a delta does a delta price doesn't have at least a hundred contracts in it, I I really think twice. Plus, it can't be just kind of out on an island by itself. Earlier in the session, we pulled up Sony and we looked at it just January, and yeah, there was. You know, there was one 70 delta option that had over 1200 contracts traded the one above and below it had virtually nothing you know that i've learned through doug as a tip off that yeah you might just want to keep on walking um okay let's see rules for bid aspirant rules for um again that's just one you you've just got to look at um I, I, I don't have a hard, fast dollar or percentage wise, but I know what does or doesn't feel right. You know, if if it gets if it starts getting to more than about 30 to 40 cents per the two spreads, I really got to look at it and decide whether it's just it, it's worth something. Uh, it. Um, why start, and then, a, why start a trade that far down? Right? Yeah, yeah, and like you've talked many times, it usually those are that's a sign that that's not an actively traded option. There's not a, a lot of activity in that. It's shown up in open interest. Um, uh, you know, it, volatility it's, could be really high. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you place a stop loss immediately after entry? Pretty much. Um, yeah, I just, I just, I, I got three accounts. I trade my IRA, my traditional, my son's IRA, and I don't have time to to be, you know, doubling back. Um, it's the old saying: if you don't have time to do it right the first time, when do you have time to do it over again? So I just execute the trade, put the stop, execute the trade, put the stop, execute the trade, put the stop. Well, and that that was a learned experience. Oh heavens! Because first, when you first started, you kind of. Um, we had that conversation in one of the coaching sessions. Um, you were kind of, well, do I really need to use the stops? Well, yeah, because I'm here watching and that kind of thing. That came from my that came from my buy and hold background. Just buy the thing and it'll go up eventually. Well, 
it doesn't always do that in options. Right. And, and you've taken some, you've had, you've had some big setbacks on a month or two when you didn't have stops and they just kind of cut the legs out from running you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Anytime I report figures, guys, um, I always report net figures. I mean, um, you know, when I have losses, I report the, the losses, or if I, I say I made a thousand bucks this month uh, and I had $1,800 of losses, but I, I, you know, everything's reported, but oh yeah, I mean, it, there is virtually no mistake you can make in trading that I haven't made. Fortunately, I've, I've just made them small enough that, um, um, you know, it hasn't, hasn't been a devastating effect, but you know, you, you, like I say, you shoot yourself in the foot or you get punched in the mouth enough times, you begin to kind of come around. I'm um, thick-headed like me. It oh, yeah. It takes a while sometimes for you to pick up on that. Uh, Mart, are you trading a 15-minute chart? I'm not. Um, I I just stick pretty much with, with, with daily. I'm, I'm having to expand my knowledge and my comfort level a little bit to four-hour charts or that type of thing. But for me, the 15-minute the chart just doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't work. And, Mart, I think he kind of answered that question in a way because he said since December 4th, you haven't made one trade. One trade. Because the market volatility has been so large, he hasn't found the trades that he's comfortable making. So he simply is standing aside and protecting his capital until his edge for a trade returns. Would you agree? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Peter's question, do you have a trigger to buy? Retest the support, are you just buying the gut feeling? No, well, I, I did, Peter. You know, boy, I like the looks of this. This is Coca-Cola. I love Coca-Cola. Boy, I'm going to buy this. And that um you know that didn't work out it cost me money and again our rules are are we you know is it a round to bottom breakout is it a pop out of the box is it the traditional like doug talks about where the it moves up pulls back to support and then again begin to accelerate upwards um uh, but again 99 percent of my trades or I've had a second set of eyes look at them to confirm what I'm seeing. You know, is this a round of bottom breakout? Is this in a buy zone? Is this the pop out of the box? Is this in a buy zone? So that's, you know, I hope I answered that question, uh, Peter, but, uh, um, you know, there, it's kind of one like of those things where you know it when you see it, and then you just get someone else to confirm that. Right. I see, Ed, you've said my volume is... is uh, low compared to Mike's. You know, Ed, people ask me, give me a rule on it. So I gave you a rule, um, a minimum of 10% or 10 times of what you're willing to trade. And I've said over and over and over that that is a minimum. Um, when we look at options in the room, have you guys, do you guys ever really find me um, looking at, at contracts that have um, less than 100 contracts on it that I'm going to recommend to anybody? And the answer to that is no. I'm always looking for more than that. And the reason is, Ed, is because I know, I know I don't have to trade every stock out there to be successful. I have to trade the right stocks, the good stocks. And so if the volume is questionable, why even waste a whole lot of time with it? Just go find another trade. There's plenty of things to trade. Don't try to make something out of nothing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, let's see. David, do you use a market order for the options? Uh, once the underlying hits the stop. Well, what... What you're talking about there, what Mike does is he follows a set of rules that I talk about. When he enters a trade, he's normally entering the, that trade based on the price action of the chart itself, right? Yeah. It's based on the price action of the chart. So you're either entering that as a market order or a limit. Just currently right now, you're entering that trade. And then you're following the volatility stop to set your stop losses. So you're not even worried about doing the calculation so much of the theoretical price of that option. 
um, where that price of that option is going to be when it trips your stop loss. You're just looking at the chart and saying, hey, if it drops below here, I don't want it anymore. And you just place your stop to sell that option right then. Exactly. You're, yeah. you're not worried about the percentage of the option loss or any of that kind of stuff. This is what the chart tells me. I'm setting my trade by that, planning by that. If it tripped out, I'm done. I don't want it anymore. Yeah. Glenn, I got to ask you to restate that question uh, about full-time versus part-time. You know, David, I probably I, I probably don't get that technical. I'll, I'll just I'll make it real easy, guys. As I look at my charts, is this chart trending upwards? Is there a, a directional call opportunity there? Is this chart tracking downwards? Is there a directional put opportunity there? That's you know, if 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 the option price isn't too much, if the bid ask spread isn't that much isn't too great if i think there's a potential there you know i make the buy i set the stop based on the the uh, volatility uh green and red dots and then i just i just go with it um okay glenn i work full time trying to figure out how to do this also boy i'll tell you what buddy my hat's off to you because and and doug has several sessions in the archives where he talked about this that is one area, Glenn, that I just did not do a good job at. This past summer, I took a job with an agronomy service uh, just to get out and, and have something to do and kind of move around. And, you know, we went from six in the morning till seven at night, um, four days a week, Monday through Thursday. And by Friday, I was so exhausted from tromping through corn and soybean fields in central Nebraska. Um I wish I had, I, I wish I had something, Glenn, that I could offer for you. Uh, that'd be one that you want to specifically talk to Doug about. Or again, he's got archive sessions um, about how he did it when he was running his construction business. Um, I I have just found I decided, guys, that I what I was going to do is I was going to make this my my job. That's that's what I decided to do. I, you know, why should I go to work for somebody else when I can make this or much more money for myself if you're if you're trading part-time while you're working guys um again my hat's off to you um the only thing i could say is low and slow sit down at night or sit down over the weekend look at your charts understand how to execute those those trades again as doug talks about where you put them in before or after the market closes but um i'm just uh, I'm just, I'm not the guy to ask on that one. Well, like Mike said, there are classes, um, our sessions in the archive, or you can even find probably something on the YouTube channel where I discuss uh, the process of, of trading if you're working full time. I will have a class coming out next year. <laughs> well, I guess tomorrow, tomorrow's yeah. next year, but it'll be a little bit longer than that. Um, next year on um, the process that I used to trade while I was working full time and um, how I grew my account just kind of slowly, mechanically, carefully um, during that time. So there is a class coming that will be dedicated completely to that subject. Um, the question, do you always move your stop on a daily basis? Um, a little bit, they're, they're, um, depending on how big a move it was, sometimes I'll start to tighten it up past the volatility indicator because if, uh, if, if we get a, a little bit of a market turn, I just want to be out of it with a profit. Um, but again, on a three-day hold, um, you know, you're not in those, those trades that long for it to really exceed pat much past that. Um, how often do you stray from the 70 delta 60 days out? A little bit. I've heard even Doug say that, hey, you know, we're going to look at a trade and there's only 39 days here or 41 days here. But I would have to I mean... I might take a 69 delta trade. I might take a 68 delta trade, depending on where it's pricing the, the option at. Um, but I would have to say about 80%, of, probably closer to 90% of my trades fall in that category. The 70% delta, 45 to 60 days out. Um, okay, I think we're kind of running out of a few questions and, and I'm probably kind of at the end of the rope, guys. Uh, Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. 
my opinion and my opinion only, but I, I am convinced of one thing, guys. As I said, uh, our war cry this year is why not me, why not us? And we might as well just do this together. So I wish you all the very best. We'll, we'll be talking to you on a continuous basis. Uh, everyone have a nice, safe New Year's, and we'll, we'll see you um, after the holiday. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone, for listening to that. Um, I will get this video put together as as soon as I can, and I will get it posted out there uh, for everyone, all the membership, to be able to see.